folks. Have a good night. I'll, uh, I'm going to pick up where, where CJ kind of left off with the um, space satellite networks. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go tonight, folks. I was asked to do this uh, yesterday. So I'm going to kind of keep it hyperdrivey, but uh, kind of give it a big tech sort of a spin. And we're going to look at quantum. We're going to look at quantum satellites and go from there. There's some uh, YouTube techie cat video, excuse me, Twitter, YouTube uh, techie cat video things that we'll look at later. But uh, for now, let's look, let's look at some satellite stuff. I found this the other day and this, um, this, this satellite patent really interested me. Hang on. That's not sharing the right window. Must be, yeah, it's this one. All right, good. There we go. So this is this this pad right here is a large scale quantum cryptographic key distribu distribution network, and it talks about distributing quantum information over a satellite network and integrating it into a land based network. Chad, I see you out there. How you guys doing? Um, I figured quantum kind of fits in the uh, the hyperdrive realm, and I haven't studied this patent in its entirety yet, but nonetheless, it needs, it needs to be shared because this is really the underpinnings of what we're constructing with 5G. It's gonna take the existing fiber-based network and integrate the tens of thousands of satellites that are going up to create point-to-point -point connections with things like cell towers and dishes and all these things that are on top of buildings. Um, and ultimately, it's going to create an environment whereby quantum communications can occur just as frequently and abundantly and seamlessly as what we understand wireless communications to be. So we're going we're gonna to review a little bit of what's in this patent, and then we're going to move on to something else because I don't want to spend too much time. But basically what this thing says, it's from Verizon, and the patent was submitted in 2006 which means that we're, you know, 15 years in on this. Thumper, for those of you that are wondering, Thumper is out campaigning for Mr. Colt. So that's where he's at. And I'm glad he's doing it because that's physical action. That is action in the physical world. So it's a very good thing. Uh, what we do here is also, also good, but literally putting foot to ass in the field that's that's where it's at um so i'm i'm grateful to be here and i'm glad he's out doing what he's doing so this thing right here space space satellite device obtains one or more encryption key symbols this is for secure comm secure encryptions via satellite and land-based networks in the quantum information field it's a device that transmits one or more encryption key symbols to multiple nodes on land in a land-based network using quantum cryptographic mechanisms. So really what this patent gets at is it's able to understand if there's uh, somebody intercepting, right? So it says right here to combat the inherent deficiencies in key distribution process. Uh, researchers have developed a key distribution technique called quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography employs quantum systems and applicable fundamental principles of physics to ensure the security of distributed keys. So when you think of sending encrypted information, when you see a secure socket layer, SSL, in your browser, or when you send uh, banking information um, or encrypted email, those are all mechanisms by which the information is sent over the internet. You're thinking it's secure, that it's safe, that it's not, not going to be hackable, crackable, intercepted. Well, quantum kind of puts all of those other systems by the wayside. Um, this is, they claim that this is completely uncrackable and we're gonna kind of look at why because it's sort of listed here in this patent. And it's kind of important because when, when, we, when we try to hold people accountable for what they do over the internet, if there are systems of encryption out there that prevent accountability from being had, then there is no recourse. There's no ramifications. So um, that's why I feel it prudent to share with you um, 
something like this because these technologies exist. They're now in the commercial sector and uh, they've moved out away from the military realm. They're now in the commercial sector and the sky's the limit with respect to being able to transmit information securely without it being detected. So it says here that they use the fundamental principles of physics to ensure the security of distributed keys. So it's just a fancy way of saying secure encrypted information being sent over the internet. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle mandates that any attempt to observe the state of a quantum system will induce a change in the state of the quantum system. So what that means is that if the information is looked at before it gets to where it wants to go, where it needs to go, if it's looked at at all, it changes the information itself, which by definition corrupts the information. So the information cannot be looked at except by the individual who has the appropriate key. It could be anywhere. It could be on this planet. It could be on another planet. It could be anywhere. And we can, we can look at things like quantum entanglement if we, if we want. I have another uh, a video to share with you. It's called quantum teleportation. That'll kind of blow your mind a little bit. We'll look at that after this. So it says here that when low, very low levels of matter or energy, such as individual photons, are used to distribute keys, the techniques of quantum cryptography permit the key distributor and receiver to determine whether any eavesdropping has occurred during the key distribution. Quantum cryptography therefore prevents an eavesdropper. In this example, they use the name Eve, right? Eve, eavesdropper. <laughs> from copying or intercepting a key that has been distributed from Alice to Bob. Without a significant probability of Bob or Alice's discovery of the eavesdropping. So in this patent, um, it talks about land-based optical networks, including fiber optic based networks, space-based or earth orbit based satellite networks having a uh, controlled or being controlled by a key management system, they can distribute these keys on land and or up in the satellites, all on the same network. And the satellite to earth networks, they call them free space links because they're still sending photons, whether it's over fiber or um, over wireless. When a wireless uh, internet connection is really just photons. That's all radio waves are, is just a, a certain energy in a wave. The, more the, the, the greater the energy, the, uh, the higher up in the electromagnetic frequency it gets. They're all just photons. So I want to find for you here, well, we'll just go in order. We all know what a LAN is. That's what you have at your house, a LAN, right? You go to the office, you got a LAN there. You have a public LAN, that's like the internet that we all use, the intranet, intranet. That's an internal based network, an intranet. Uh, GPRS, cellular packet data, mobile IP subnetworks. So now we're, we're into the wireless realm. All of these things are applicable with respect to being able to transmit quantum encryption keys over the internet. So our internet, as we understand it, also is able to facilitate quantum communications. That's really the underlying premise here. Kind of a, kind of a big deal. So it talks about um, having a radio frequency link, RF link to satellites. Satellites may then, based on the instructions received from a key management system, begin distributing encryption key symbols to selected ones of network nodes for example, through th free space links using quantum cryptographic techniques. So they can send quantum information wirelessly over the internet, which means that there's likely quantum communications going on over like cell phone networks, just as well as there are from satellites. Because fundamentally, the physics there are the same. It's just that the broadcast is from space rather than from tower, from some tower in your neighborhood. And there's a key component in here that I found. I've, I've read this thing once, and so bear with me here. I think it's right here. It says here, free space quantum transmitters. So that's a real fancy way of saying 
Real fancy way of saying this is a wireless transmitter. It could be your Wi-Fi router. It could be a cell phone tower. It could be uh, an over-the-air broadcast television tower, AM, FM radio tower, a satellite tower. It could be a point-to-point -point wireless system. Free space quantum transmitter is just a radio antenna. It's really all it is. May include components for distributing encryption key symbols via a, a free space link, right, over the air, right, through the air, or in a vacuum, because that's what we're allegedly told space is, right, in a vacuum. So free space link, meaning it's not encased or enclosed within a cable, a fiber optic cable, in the examples they provide here. In one implementation, free space quantum transmitters, just radio transmitters may distribute encryption key symbols by encoding each encryption key symbol value into the phase polarization or energy state of the transmitted photon. What does that mean? Well, when we look at how wireless communications are sent, they use phase polarization, amplitude and frequency to send ones and zeros from point A to point B. So what this is telling me as I read this is that using specific phase, polarization, frequencies, amplitudes, they are able to encrypt quantum key symbols in the, in the transmission of wireless communication. So what is that? How does that translate into the real world? That means while you're streaming YouTube, they could literally be using that wireless link and encode or embed quantum key distribution information over that wireless link and use your phone as a hop to send those keys to somebody else or something else that you might be in the middle of the network on. Now, why would they do that? The simple answer is, is because your phone provides a power source and a link that's not necessarily on the network. And it might be the, the most direct way to get a distributed quantum key to some other device for some type of communication. So from a, from a surveillance perspective, it'd be very useful to be able to bunny hop around on everybody's devices using the wireless links that they use for YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, email, phone calls to distribute ongoing, constantly changing quantum encryption keys. And it doesn't all have to come from the satellite network or the cell network. It can be timed from the satellite network and the cell network. It can be timed that way because everything has a, has a clock in it so that the signals line up so that you have a good quality of service. If you didn't have a good clock in your phone or your tablet or your computer, when you're streaming something like YouTube, you wouldn't get a nice, clean, seamless stream. You wouldn't get a clean video. It would be jumbled up. It wouldn't make sense. It would crash. It would, case in point would be, a few years ago, like about a decade, when you were driving down the road on a cell phone on the freeway, how often did your calls drop? And I ask you, how often do they drop now? It has everything to do with the timing and the handoffs from cell tower to cell tower with your phone while you're driving 60 miles an hour down the road. The cell tower has to track your phone. So if you're streaming YouTube in the car, you think about the mechanics of how that works, there is an electromagnetic beam that is focused on that car that is providing you with the signal that gives you the streamless streaming experience that you're having. And the handoffs from one tower to the next are much better than they are right now. So back to this whole quantum encryption distribution network, they can use the communications to and from your devices to send information around a community, a state, a country, the world. And a good example of that would be blockchain type technology where they use device to device communication over a blockchain network to send encrypted uh, one time only type information from device to device, it doesn't even have to use the cell network. It may jump on the cell network, but all it needs is the right clock timing so that it understands 
when it can send information and what device is available to make sure that the, the timestamps, if you will, still uh, are maintained. And that's one way of tracking it. So going back to this patent here, it says here that um, <laughs> crazy. Um, it shows here, it says here, free space quantum transmitters may include a quantum source, a quantum modulator, an optional quantum beam, directional control unit, quantum source may emit quantum particles, such as, for example, photons. In one implementation, a quantum source may include a photon source, such as, for example, a laser. Well, microwaves do the same thing. So a quantum source could literally just be antennas. Doesn't matter where the antennas are. It's whether or not it talks on a quantum network. And that's where 5G comes into play. Because with 5G, they are standardizing the network topologies. Right now, you have multiple layers of technology. As new technology comes online, it's designed to be forwards and backwards compatible with the older technology. Well, the jump with 5G it's going to have backwards compatibility, but it's going to really push for an entirely new platform that standardize, standardizes the internet from the top down, from the satellites all the way down to your phone, all the way down to nano networks that potentially are gonna reside in medical implanted devices in your body. We'll all have the same internet, general internet platform, TCP, IP being a, a major standard as well as ethernet. Those are terms I think everybody generally understands. They are literally gonna be running ethernet networks over the satellites. And the new uh, connections to large businesses, mid-sized businesses and small businesses are going to be ethernet based rather than be DSL based or IP DSL based or VDSL based. They are going to be ethernet as far out as they can as close to the end user devices as possible and so as we migrate to these newer upgraded networks ethernet's going to get pushed further and further out and that ties in to the white rabbit switches made by cern that ultimately set the atomic clock timing over ethernet networks that's forwards and backwards compatible with ethernet and it's it's good beyond nanosecond timing and when we're dealing in the quantum fields, nanosecond and picosecond timing are important because timing is everything in the quantum encryption world. And so it says here that one implementation, a satellite may include a free space quantum transmitter, so just the radio antennas that beam down satellite energy onto, onto land or across to another satellite with each being capable of being independently directed. So steerable phased array antennas, being able to steer and direct focused energy to provide a beam of quantum particles to different ones of nodes. So they make it sound all ooh, quantum particles. It's really, it's just photons, but it's photons that are modulated in such a way that they, they allow for quantum encryption to take place. It says, I want to look, I want to find where they talk about intercept because they literally talk about being able to, to intercept um, when interception occurs. I think I remember a key term. Uh, nope. Let's see if, uh, okay. It says here to, no, we already read this. I'm still looking. Hey, TMC, how you doing tonight? What's up, buddy? I thought I heard you in the background. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was waiting. I was like, oh, oh. I what do you got, man? I was out over uh, um, the computer's names. 
Alice and Bob. Yeah, they're, they're standard. Uh, when they talk quantum, man, they, they use Alice and Bob as pretty standard. Uh, here we go. I think I found something that I want to. Uh, so what, what, tell me, tell me what, uh, what excited you about hearing Alice and Bob? Well, Eve, you know, who Eve is in biblical terms. Yeah. But, um, since I had figured out A, B, and C and, and D, I didn't know what E was. So I, I pumped an E. And the interesting thing is when you, when you do a search about these, um, AIs, yeah, they list them as all, um, fictional characters, <laughs> which is horse crap. If you ask me, um, because they've obviously named all these and they just, they just, and I've actually got the list now and Wikipedia can't take it from me because I copied and pasted it. So, um, I still believe knowing who you're, who you're battling is, is, is a prevalent idea. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, you got me all ears on this <laughs> cool. satellite stuff. That's real interesting. Yeah, this is, um, well, when you, when you know that Elon Musk is throwing up a minimum of 11,000 of these things, and that's just his company. Europe and Richard Branson are throwing up their own constellations. China's throwing up their own 5G constellations. India's throwing up constellations. Russia's throwing up constellations. I'm sure Israel's throwing up constellations. And I'm sure there are others that are throwing up constellations, and they're all going to interoperate with each other. Um, th this, is, this is where we're going, because at some point it's going to be, and I found these patents. I need to dig them up again. Um, I didn't write them down. They're somewhere in my tabs. Where... They talk about, they talk about uh, quantum, no, they talk about satellite communication directly to cell phones with 5G for um, areas that don't have cell towers, and it's limited connectivity. And so it's not a sat phone, it's different than that. It's literally cell service, but, it, but it's done with the 5G satellite, whereby the 5G satellite is able to send information to your phone and then read the electromagnetic field around your phone as your phone transmits a response. And from the emitted field from the phone, it's able to see a change in the electromagnetic field that's beaming down on the phone and is able to then convert that into a receive signal at the satellite. So the satellite's transmitting information to the phone and it's also transmitting electromagnetic beams down as sensors to pick up the electromagnetic radiation that's coming off of the phone based on the, the response signal, the phone trying to communicate back. And from the changes that are made in the electromagnetic field, that's the sensor field from the satellite, it's able to understand what the phone's trying to say. And the bandwidth requirements or the bandwidth availability in a remote area like that would be equivalent for a grainy kind of phone call or text messages or, or, or basic text email. It's not going to be like high speed. It's not going to be like high speed connectivity at all. What it does provide is emergency services with something as basic as a $300 cell phone that's 5G compatible. So in two to two to four years, if you go hiking in the mountains or you're out in the middle of the lake or you go into the desert or you go somewhere where there's not towers around that are providing you regular cell service, you still get 911 is basically how I think that's going to be rolled out. And I've got those patents somewhere. I read that and I was blown away. Yeah, and uh, a little, I've got all these little birdies. A little birdie was telling me basically that um, the information can be stored in every living cell. So like they can put, put, put the information in different places and it just, it just sits there. Yeah, it's funny you say that because we're gonna we're gonna move into a, a DNA resonance patent here in a minute, and it talks about being able to identify specific genes inside of DNA based on its resonant characteristics. And and, and the little birdie might be listening. Uh, <laughs> sounds like because <it. laughs> because I think he, uh, we've talked about him before, but he's the one that showed me to the show in the first place. But um, I also sent to you the. Um, SpaceX deploys the little mini, those mini little satellites for Elon Musk. You know what yeah, I'm talking about? Um, I forgot the name of them. They're, they're little I, sub, I, they're sub satellites. 
Yeah, I posted that in, in your Discord. You might want to play that. I think it's really interesting because they're like a black and white box. Heck yeah, and, and they've got like a little eye in the center, and it's like, uh, that's so strange. But um, I, I just sent that to you. And then the other thing that got me thinking on this whole um, document was back to Eve for a second. Um, if you look up Eve, it also shows you that there's um, a computer named Eve. It was like a, a launch of a Microsoft computer, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it got me thinking the way they're describing Eve as a listener in between the quantum fields. What if they did a similar thing from what you were just describing um, as Eve as an intelligence sorted in many computers over a vast array looking to do her business as an artificial intelligence already encrypted into the backlogs of people's computers and, and that specific model probably. Yeah. So it's, it's who has the hidden, quantum high ground is as a way I'm hidden, understanding what you're postulating there. A hidden AI that's yeah. already put inside certain computers because right. so if, they, could, they could they could take a section of your hard drive and and deem it as unusable and then and then hide that one percent or even a point zero 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 one percent you know five percent or ha like not a five percent like a half percent like we're talking like a thousandths of a percent or something right or hundreds of thousands of a percent but they hide it in so many and then it adds up to to uh, the the artificial intelligence of a massive supercomputer right and that's the um there's a term for that and universities use that technique to you can donate your computer a part a part of your computer processor to a larger network bits i think it's BitTorrent. i think type of BitTorrent, where they basically use every a piece of everybody's computer processor to create giant supercomputer type processing capabilities uh, but you're saying this 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 kind of stuff could be done in the background. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to agree. Of people unsuspecting. Well, yeah. Well, if you if you were gonna if you cornered the market like Apple, and you had fifty percent of of all mobile devices deployed globally, why wouldn't you? You you literally have the ability to using free energy to you it's free energy because other people are paying to charge their phones other people are paying for the cell networks and the wi-fi networks by which the phones are connected to then run in the background because they have auto connection type features to understand and make sure that the the channel states are what they need to be to run the apps and so everything doesn't crash and they they are able to ping and 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 allow for um uh, diagnostics to go back, whether you consent to it or not. So through those uh, back doors, if you will, you could totally do exactly what you're saying. Have a little piece of everybody's device and collectively distribute computation functions over the entire array of devices that you've produced or manufactured and have now been deployed through the consumption, through consumer markets to then utilize uh, in real time a little piece of everybody's processor in their mobile device to do whatever it is you wanted to do. And it wouldn't be just strictly for computation. That could be for, you know, a, a secondary tertiary type of a connection where it's, it's, a, it's a whole nother uh, behind the scenes network that's, that's enabled. Um, and so, yeah, and going back to this, this patent, the, uh, to your point, who has, who has the quantum high ground? If, if, a, if, a, if a field already exists and then quantum communications occur in that field, do those quantum communications disturb that field? And because the quantum communications were generated in that field, can you observe the change without disrupting the communication whereby because the quantum communication was originated in an existing surveillance field 
there wouldn't be a disruption. The creation and transmission of the information is a disruption to the field, but it would be a normal action or iteration as the quantum information was was being sent. And that's that's the real that that's that's the question I have at this point. If you were to have a, a blanket of surveillance fields, wireless fields over everything, and you had the that cyber supremacy, if quantum communications were being used and they were being used in that field that was already there before the quantum communications were sent, would it disrupt the quantum communications or would the quantum communications have to be created in that field whereby it's part of its normal environment? It wouldn't be abnormal. So the field disturbance when the quantum communication is actually generated and sent can then be a point of measurement as an omnipotent type of a point of measurement. It's not a direct measurement of the quantum information. So it doesn't really destroy it. And that's, anyway, that's way beyond my scope of understanding of quantum mechanics, but damn, if that's possible, it, we're just, whoa. So we'll, we'll look at this last part and then we'll, I think we'll move to DNA because we're, we're like a half hour in on this. So the values of the quantum key distribution symbols, a high or a low symbol value may be interpreted by the polarization phase or energy states of incoming photons. The polarization phase or energy state of each received photon may be measured and interpreted to identify a symbol value for each received photon. So what does this mean? If you want to send wireless communication or if you want to send optical communication over fiber optics, every single pulse is a photon or a series of photons that have unique characteristics. And what this is basically saying is that they can understand with great specificity what those characteristics are and use that for quantum key distribution and by extension quantum information exchange so if, if anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna continue learning about this and i'll share more of it as time goes on but this to me this is really what the new networks are about when, when we look at 5g and we look at the satellites and this that and the other it, it, it's quantum and we look at cyber and cyber command and cyber supremacy, it's, it literally is in the quantum field. And when we start looking at nanotechnology, those uh, energy transfers in the nano scale occur in the quantum or occur with quantum mechanics, quantum physics. So you look at nanotech and it, it exchanges information, reads information, understands information in, in the quantum realm. So that's why this is important to me. That's why I look at this stuff and go, whoa, this is kind of a big deal because they're constructing nano networks that are going to be universally connected from a nano network all the way up to a satellite global network or an interplanetary network all basically run with at a minimum what i see here quantum cryptographic key dis distribution so can you imagine having your body or your device that's near your body all the time being a, a part of a quantum network do you have access to that quantum network or is it just something that's going to be there because you happen to have a device or maybe something in your body? And if that's the case, where's the accountability? Especially because when you disrupt a quantum communication, it goes away. The information is destroyed. So how do you track it? Which took me naturally to that. What if you have this, this general surveillance field that already exists and then the quantum information is sent? That, that surveillance field, I think, would maintain itself. It wouldn't disrupt the communications, but you still understand to some extent what they were. Super advanced um, uh, surveillance techniques, if it's true. I don't know. I'm hypothesizing here. So let's move on. This pattern right here. And then, uh, you know what? Before we do that, I want to show, show you this. And then I'll go, over to, I'll go over to Discord. I forgot about that video that you said you, you sent me. Check, check this thing out. 
So it wouldn't be very long. I think it's only like a 30 second or 40 yeah. second thing. We'll watch, we'll watch this one and then I'll, I'll jump over and, and grab that real quick. This is a uh, quantum teleportation. I'm Brian Green, professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University and co-founder of the World Science Festival. Teleportation is one of the weird ideas, and there is a version of it that physicists now routinely make use of. Nobody is teleporting people from place to place, but we can teleport individual particles. We can take a particle at one location and in some sense create an absolute identical version of it exactly the same properties, exactly the same quantum state, if you let me be a little technical. And that means, in essence, you've gone from a particle that was here to one over here. And in fact, the process itself destroys the particle over here. So the only version of this particle that exists when this process is over is the one that's been created at this location. And people do this. There's very, very smart physicist, Anton Zeilinger. He routinely teleports particles from Tenerife to La Palma. It's an amazing thing that you can actually do this. The big question, of course, is will you ever teleport big things like people? And the procedures that are used for individual particles simply do not scale. You cannot simply scale them up to do more and more particles, I don't think. But who knows, 500, 1,000 years from now, maybe we'll have something on the table that we can try out. If it happens in our lifetime, I can tell you one thing for certain. I will not be the first person who goes into that device. All right. So I'm going to look in Discord. There was a question out there. Could that be done on phones or does it have to be uh, a processor? Um, Hoovian Anon. I'm going to pull up a document real quick that may help answer that question. Well, I'd take a crack at that one. <laughs> yeah, please, because we're going we're gonna to look well, at this. Well, it, it would only make sense that the architecture of a quad-core um, phone or even greater would, would be able to do the same thing as, uh, you know, a processor that's a few years old, you know, 10 years old or something on a, on a, on a regular computer. Um, if you look at the price price point, it should tell you, you know, if you pay $1,500 for a phone, and you pay $1,200 for a computer, even though the phone is smaller and not as in that same year as strong as, you know, uh, strong or operating faster or, you know, whatever you want to rate the, the processor as, um, I would reckon that it's, it's real close. Yeah, um, it's, it can be done um, and it can be done, I think in the processor, it can also be done in uh, the other sensors. And so when we look at advanced ways of interacting with devices, um, it, it's, with things, it's with things like this, quantum acoustic, a uh, quantum acoustics with surface acoustic waves. This is just one way that this can be done. And it says here, it is recently demonstrated that surface acoustic waves can interact with superconducting qubits at the quantum level. Surface acoustic wave resonators in the gigahertz frequency range have also been found to have low loss at temperatures compatible with superconducting quantum circuits. These advances open up new possibilities to use the phonon, which is just a, the um, acoustic wave version of a photon, which is a planar wave instead of a longitudinal wave. Um, use the phonon uh, degree of freedom to carry quantum information. So what this is saying is that, that they are able to carry quantum information using acoustic waves that basically um, ride on top of surfaces. So what that means is that they can resonate they can resonate devices and with unique resonances encrypt and or transmit quantum information over those unique resonant characteristics. So when, when you look at integrated circuits, and you're the example you, you provided, Paul, like a, a phone that costs that much money, there are circuits in those phones that they do more than one thing. They're tied into everything, and they have complex um, solid-state switches, basically, that, that through 
uh, the processor and, and software it tell or provide instruction to these circuits what to energize and when and what to look for and what to sense and what to read. And they use the same circuit paths. So a lot of the sensors and whatnot that are in the phone are hooked up to these flexible type circuits that could theoretically, I'm not saying it's true, theoretically be used or energized when those specific components in the device are resonated in a certain kind of a way. So they can get them to resonate and then perhaps turn them off, turn them on, turn them off, turn them on in a certain sequence that then activates a certain amount of voltage with the right types of pulsing and or modulation, which then provides communication to the phone in a covert manner. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, um, the, the chatter uh, edge EW thumb said, is it a wave or is it a particle? And I, I think um, the wave transposes the information of the particle to the other side. And then that it's like riding the wave uh, you could say information wave, but um, yeah, it's a, a quantum wave, but ra riding that quantum wave informationally, and then the particle is um, just ha the information of that particle is resurrected on the other side. Thank you. A, a photon, they say a photon is both. It's a particle and a wave, but then there are people that dismiss that who, who claim to know a lot about quantum. They say that that's wrong. I, I don't, I don't have enough knowledge one way or another to really be able to, to give you an opinion other than what I've, what I've read, the, the common literature out there indicates that a photon is a particle and a wave and that a phonon is basically just energy that's being transmitted through particles that are in place. There's yeah. I, I can't like tell you how I know. Sure. <laughs> I just know. You, you you were with me on this, right, TMC? Yeah, I, I um, it's something I it's something I want to learn a lot more about because this is this is where this is where we're going, and I th honestly I think that quantum mechanics should be introduced to kids, children, in in a very rudimentary way in like junior high, and then for the smart smart children in in high school get them involved in you know, one-on-one level quantum mechanics before they even get to college. But we're, we're moving in the wrong direction um, as it relates to that. So anyway, this... Yeah, we're, we're still worried about which bathroom to use, right? Right. It says here, with the development of radar in the mid-20th century, a need arose for advanced processing of radio frequency and microwave signals. Important class of components created to fill this need is based on surface acoustic waves, mechanical ripples that propagate across the face of the solid. When surface acoustic waves are used for signal processing, the surface of a microchip is used as a medium of propagation. An electrical RF signal is converted into an acoustic wave, processed acoustically, and then converted back into the electrical domain. The substrate is almost univers universally piezoelectric. So, what they're really saying here is in order to get phased array radar, phased array to work properly, they use the acoustic waves because they actually uh, travel slower than light, than electromagnetic waves. So in order to get a phased array radar to work properly, they literally convert the energy into acoustic waves and then use the acoustic waves, which travel slower than the radio frequency waves, they use those to time when each antenna element fires. And so, anyway, we're not going to oh, get into the guts of this paper, but it... One, one quick thing is, is they mentioned P0 electric, right? Yeah. And um, the interesting thing is if you look up the P0 family mm -hmm. from ancient Rome, you'll figure a lot of stuff out. There's a philosopher, he wrote... And he broke sections of the Bible and different things, i.e., um, die hold foundation. Just, just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, I've never, never gone down that trail. It sounds interesting. Yeah. Piezo, yeah. Someone in, piezo in chat Rome. mentioned. Someone in chat mentioned Satan, and basically, it's saying that Satan didn't exist because. Um, Pisa was the one that invented Satan and that it was just a thought in his head and he put it out in the paperwork. 
So it's just uh, it's a philosophical debate slash religious debate. But I won't go any further. Cool. <laughs> you can look at it yourself. Yeah, my I wrote down uh, I wrote down Piezo family and then Rome. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. That'll get me going in the right direction. They give some examples here. Gallium arsenide keeps popping up in the in the in the stuff I'm looking at with satellites and uh, um, microelectronics and and what what they say here is piezoelectric materials, gallium arsenide. So, and some of these things, Piezo yeah, piezoelectric crystal, crystal, yeah, some, crystal. Some of these things are create the um, uh, mechanoluminescent nanoparticles that that. I shared, I don't know, it's probably been a month or so ago where they are able to convert ultrasound into light emitting or they use ultrasound to energize mechanoluminescent nanoparticles to emit light. Uh, and they can, they can float that stuff around your body. Uh, anyway, let's, let's go to this, let's go to this DNA resonance pattern and we'll look at that real quick. Oh, hold on to SpaceX. Let's watch this thing deploy here real quick. I forgot about this. So what, what was this, Paul? You said this was a, star, a Starlink uh, deployment of a, of, a, of a cube? Yeah, these are actually the little satellites that are all those Starlinks. So that's what my understanding of them is. And you can see two or three of them released. And they look like white and black boxes with a hole, like a whole real weird circular hole in the center. Mm -hmm. And I, I just like, can hardly imagine that's a satellite, but have a look. <laughs> All right. Should be hearing a call out for the first SkySat shortly. SkySat one separation confirmed. And there's that confirmation that that first SkySat has deployed. Now these three SkySats Oh, and it looks like we can actually see there's that first SkySat satellite. Pretty awesome view. We should hear a call out for the second one here shortly. They're deploying in about 30 second increments here. SkySat 2 separation confirmed. And there's a confirmation for the second SkySat. And since we saw the first one, I think we should be able to see that second one shortly here as well. And there you can see it. Very cool views today. Now we just are waiting for that last and third, that third and final SkySat here shortly. SkySat three separation confirmed. And there's confirmation of separation of that final SkySat. These, th these three SkySats will be joining 15 already in orbit, and three more will be deploying on a separate Starlink mission later this summer, completing their fleet of 21 SkySats. Crazy. So, yeah, it looks like the imagery that they used, Paul, wasn't uh, just wasn't regular camera. It was something else. Well, yeah, and the interesting thing is they might actually fold out. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not probably sure that that's the, the total span of what they look like, but I thought it was kind of interesting anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. They don't – it's hard to get a, a good idea of, of what, what size they are, you know what I mean? But I, I do remember, I think the term I'm looking for, they have microsats and maybe picosats where, where they launch these satellites and then out, out of these satellites come little smaller node satellites where like three or four of them are stored inside of a larger satellite and they, they become part of the network. I'm sure they don't have as many capabilities, but they're probably just a way to extend how things are hopped and how traffic is managed. Another little birdie that sent me that he sent me a few more if anyone's interested i'll post them up might as well man all right let's dig into this one because this this um kind of ties into our discussion we were having on wednesday on hyperdrive about uh dna and um i mean we went all over the place with dna and so i, I found this patent 
a while ago, lost it, meaning I just it wasn't on the radar and then found it again. And so basically what this says is that this is a patent for uh, readily and efficiently determining, determining resonant frequencies that can be used therapeutically or beneficially for debilitation of specific types of genomic material, genetic material, including DNA and or RNA, genes and gene sections. The methods can be used in a variety of circumstances related to various human and animal diseases and conditions. These methods allow determination of therapeutic resonant frequencies for use in various media and have different refractivities. Therapeutic or beneficial resonant frequencies thus determined are adapted for use with currently available frequency emitting devices, currently available frequency emitting devices by shifting the resonant frequencies to electromagnetic ranges capable of generation by such devices. So what does that mean? That means that even though your DNA resonates in the infrared, generally, and the terahertz range, they just use what they call a subharmonic, and they can resonate your DNA down at like 500 hertz, 300 hertz, and anywhere in between 300 hertz up through and two gigahertz and terahertz, which means that we have systems around us right now that if modulated properly could potentially be doing things like reading our DNA. That's what I'm getting out of this patent, but let's, you know, well, let's go through it and you be the judge, judge for yourself. I, ag I agree with you on that. Um, last video that the footage is, is a little, um, buzzy, isn't it? And for, for such a good, um, uh, thing yeah. that people want, would want to see, it doesn't yeah. make sense that the footage is so unclear. Right. You would, it's like they intentionally lensed it with something. Well, and I would imagine for good reason, you would not want high definition images of these satellites because they're likely full of proprietary information, potentially classified information. So, and, and, yeah, I agree. And then the next sort of thing that I was, uh, I think it's a bit unfair about um, the topic of this uh, patent that uh, if you and I went to use any of this stuff that um, to heal people, we'd be thrown in jail. But yet they're they're way out in the open with saying, hey, we can heal you. We can do all this great miraculous stuff with all these different therapeutical things and with all these different medicines. And then, then oh, no, you guys can't use any of that stuff because if you do – it's illegal. It's pseudoscience, and all of a sudden now it's um, it's uh, pseudo medicine, and so I, I think that's real BS too. Pisses me off. Yeah, it's uh, from what I've been able to understand in a general sense, looking at stuff I've looked at, mostly electromagnetic, but also I'm seeing the same things with sound and light. Everything that can be done medically can be done better with directed energy, with focused energy. It can, it can be more lethal or it can be more healing than the, the methods of medicine that we understand in a general sense. It, it's ridiculous what they can do with this stuff. Um, for example, it says here, resonant frequency therapy is a non-invasive treatment that has been reported to offer significant relief to sufferers of a variety of ailments and medical conditions. The use of radio frequency therapy for human and animal therapeutic purposes began in the early 1900s and experienced accelerated development through the research of, the Royal, of Royal Rife and his associates in the 1930s and afterwards. So the Rife machines, for those of you that don't know what they are, those were just uh, I believe they were acoustic resonance uh, machines that uh, delivered very, very sophisticated for their time, very sophisticated um, modulations into the body to get the right uh, resonance to occur in the body that actually offered healing therapy, legitimate therapy. Um, says using new microscope technology, he developed Rife discovered that plasma waves, there it is, could be used to transmit radio and audio frequencies, which were tuned to the frequencies of specific microorganisms 
and that each microorganism responded to its own unique frequencies. For example, Rife found that Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, microorganisms associated with tuberculosis, typhoid, leprosy, as well.